this is Mr. Coates. This is the third video for Unit 1, uh, the human population and its impacts. This particular slideshow and lecture is going to be on globalization and urban sustainability. So what is globalization? Basically, it's how uh, people across the world are getting together for social, economic, environmental changes, and this leads to an ever-increasingly integrated world. So we're basically getting rid of borders through globalization. It happens through trade, it happens through uh, sharing of ideas, it happens with companies. Companies all over the world buy different areas throughout the world, have different offices throughout the world. So the world is becoming increasingly more global rather than individualized. So how has this happened? One of the first ways, of course, has been planes here. So airplanes flying across the oceans and linking up uh, cultures relatively quickly. Uh, within 24 hours, you can be clear across the other side of the earth in an airplane now. Other ways it happened, uh, satellite communications. We started communicating across the globe with satellites, allowed us to phone across the, the oceans as well. Uh, cell phones also become a big issue now with uh, the ability of smartphones, things like that. And then, of course, one of the biggest ones is the World Wide Web here. So it allowed uh, all of the people of the planet to get together and uh, start working on these things as a global community. Immigration also played a role in this, obviously. Um, when people came from different parts of the, the uh, planet and started settling, especially in the United States with our immigration laws, uh, we had things pop up like Chinatown, and this basically uh, allowed a different culture to set up areas and influence uh, Americans with their culture. So nowadays you see all kinds of things, sushi for example, in a lot of restaurants. When I was growing up, you couldn't find sushi anywhere, and now it's, it's everywhere. You can't go anyplace without finding a sushi bar somewhere. So uh, the fact that uh, new food items uh, come from here. When I grew up, basically all you could find was tacos. Uh, so uh, the food choices are coming in. Other things that happened are lax immigration policy here. Uh, in uh, the United States, we have a very lax immigration policy when it comes to especially Cuban refugees. This is uh, the aerial boat lift here of people that uh, reconfigured a truck to float across the Florida Straits from Cuba. But basically, this allowed all kinds of cultures to come in the U.S. and uh, this is why we call ourselves the melting pot, obviously, because of all those cultures coming together, which makes the U.S. more of an integrated uh, state or integrated uh, culture than most. When we look at the global economy, there are several organizations out there that actually influence this. The first one is the World Bank. The World Bank is a not-for-profit organization that basically looks at how to get those developing nations uh, wealth. So it looks to how can uh, those developing nations develop their resources, how can they become uh, more uh, developed. And so it looks at basically changing some of the wealth on the planet, taking, the, taking some of the wealth from the wealthier nations and starting to develop those uh, undeveloped nations. Another one is the International Monetary Fund. Now the International Monetary Fund actually sets up global monetary policy. And so they're in charge of uh, determining uh, how money goes across continents. Uh, they set up exchange rates and so forth. So that is one uh, way the economies are connected globally. And then, of course, of course, Wall Street. Wall Street's a huge one where you trade and sell companies or pieces of companies. And now at Wall Street, you can buy parts of Japanese corporations or Russian corporations or Korean corporations. And then each of those nations also has their own stock exchanges, and so they can buy parts of U.S. corporations. So the economy is becoming more and more integrated across the globe because of the stock markets. Another thing that unfortunately also happened to the economy when we had the crash of 2008 with the housing boom here in the United States. And because of our great influence across the world, this brought the world economy uh, to a standstill for quite a long time, for about three years, really. And so uh, this, um, this link to all of the other economies is quite a, a, a problem sometimes. Sometimes it's a good thing, but in the case of 2008, it was quite a problem. Uh, still today, problems overseas with Europe, uh, specifically Italy and Spain uh, and Greece, are actually 
affecting our economy still. And so those countries uh, just don't have their economic house in order. And so they're dragging down other economies, especially European economies. So how does this all tie into the environment? Well, basically what happens is you see people moving. People move into those areas that have better jobs um, and uh, things like that. Also companies start going outsourcing to places that have cheaper labor. And uh, because of phones and things like that can go across the oceans in a matter of seconds now, uh, we get phone calls from India all the time uh, from somebody uh, trying to sell us some kind of technology product or something. Uh, faster resource distribution. Now that resources can get across the globe very quickly, uh, basically uh, those resources can be redistributed fairly quickly. So a lot of times what happens is, is that the redistribution goes from the developing countries to the developed countries that can afford to redistribute those resources because it can happen so fast now. Uh, in the early 1960s, uh, we started uh, making our way to uh, the moon and one of the things that happened is that uh, they took a picture of the planet from the moon and uh, basically what this showed people was that we lived in a finite area. And so that kind of brought people together as well as a uh, globe. They kind of saw that we are stuck on this little blue ball out in the darkness, uh, vastness of space, and uh, we have to rely on each other. Other things that are happening is uh, the United Nations. Obviously, the United Nations is uh, there to uh, set policy and to uh, try and keep world order. Uh, sometimes they are successful, sometimes they're not. Um, and then the other thing that's happened globally versus the environment, uh, basically, is climate change. And all the stuff that's going on in the developing countries is affecting everyone else in the world. In fact, we have pollution over 100% of the planet now, even in areas where people don't live, like Antarctica. And so, uh, because of all the things that we do, the entire planet now is being affected. Also, things like uh, different cultures getting together. Uh, and so we need to look at this and see, are we going to be able to get together as different cultures? And what I like to see is coexist, and where all these different religious, ethnic groups get together and, and can, can live together in harmony without having to uh, fight and things like that and take resources from each other. And so that's a big problem here is us getting together as a major group on the planet and deciding that we're going to live together in peace and harmony and distribute those resources in a manner so everyone can live in peace. Alright, so moving on to cities. One of the problems in uh, the modern age is that we are moving out of the rural areas into the cities, uh, but in huge droves. Now the good thing about this is that uh, this is lowering our population. When women and families move into large cities, basically this uh, stops the fertility rate or slows the fertility rate down, so that slows down population growth. The bad thing about urban sustainability is that uh, we put a bunch of people in a small spot. So we have all these buildings, so all these people are uh, driving their cars in the same spot, they're all... Um, eating food, trying to get food into this one spot, so there's a lot of traffic into the city uh, and things like that. And then also you have problems with a lot of poor in urban areas. This is a slum down in Brazil and it's a shanty town right outside the capital of Brazil and these people have built their homes out of old pieces of lumber, uh, shipping crates, uh, old tin they find around. They will even scavenge garbage dumps to find things to build their houses and they basically build on top of each other. And so this is a shanty town. So with people moving to cities, we're starting to get these areas throughout the globe we call mega cities and also known as megapolises. And so there are um, there's about 12 to 15 megalopses uh, that are basically made up of 10 million or more people. Uh, the problem is that only three of these, only three of these are in developed countries. Obviously, New York's one of them, LA is another one, and then the other one is down here, probably in uh, Tokyo over here. 
the rest of these megalopuses with all these people in it are um, in developed developing countries and all of these have huge shanty towns uh, they have poor sanitation conditions they, uh, they, they they can't get enough food in these areas they can't get enough electricity if you look at the light in these areas um, basically those areas that have lights and have electricity a lot of these megalopuses don't have any electricity in them and uh, so that's a huge problem as well even Beijing uh, lacks electricity sometimes so what are some environmental problems with cities? First of all, um, cities, like I said, bring in a lot of people, a lot of infrastructure. They use a lot of resources. So it takes a lot of steel, a lot of concrete, uh, a lot of asphalt, a lot of piping, both in copper and things like that. So you take a lot of resources just to build your city here. Another thing is this, basically, cities put out a lot of energy. And so what they do is that they have their own uh, microclimate called a heat island and basically that means that they put out a, ho a hotter temperature because of all the workings all the automobiles and things like that cities are four to five degrees warmer uh, Fahrenheit than their surrounding rural areas uh, another thing with cities is the problem with um, flooding when you build a city, all this concrete up here is impervious to rainwater. So when it rains, all this water runs off into the streets. And if you have good enough sewer systems, then it can handle that. However, the problem is a lot of times the sewer systems get clogged and you get flooding. The other thing is it can create flooding downstream. And so uh, by building a city, you can actually flood an area downstream that didn't used to flood because the city shed so much water because it's impervious. Another problem is, is that uh, this water used to be filtered by all the natural vegetation, like this forest up here. And uh, now that you don't have that filtration, you get a lot more pollution coming off the land with uh, stormwater runoff. And as I said, when you build a city, you take away the natural habitat, so you lose biodiversity. And habitat. Another problem is what we call urban cities. When cities start to grow, they have two options. They can grow up or they can grow out. And when they grow out, we call this urban sprawl. So this is a picture of Las Vegas and this is I believe in the uh, 60s and then this is in the early 80s down here and basically uh, it shows how the city has spread out over time uh, and not a very long time, a very short time and really taken over large areas of land but the city hasn't gone up so this is called urban sprawl and we have a huge problem with that here in Florida especially Pinellas County and Hillsborough County our city doesn't grow up, it actually grows out another negative about cities is traffic and congestion uh, when you bring all those people into one place, especially here in the United States where we have very little mass transit, then you get a gridlock. You get bumper to bumper traffic for hours and hours. I remember one time I was in LA during rush hour traffic and I was in bumper to bumper traffic for three hours just trying to get through LA. Uh, it's a, you get a lot of pollution concentrated from the tailpipes as well. Uh, once again, all this pavement creates the heat island effect. And then you get a lot of noise pollution, people honking horns, just the noise of large trucks, things like that. So you have a lot of problems with noise pollution and other pollution coming from traffic and congestion. And if cities were uh, in the United States would get on board and get with mass transit, a lot of this, these environmental problems would go away. This leads us into how do cities plan then? Uh, in order to uh, grow efficiently and to set up their services. Uh, one way they can do this is through land use planning. And basically what this allows the uh, city to do is to plan its infrastructure. So little parts of the city uh, have industry, some have housing, some parks, and etc. Okay, different types of land use. And we use this here a lot in the United States, so we don't have conflicts between this one and this one. And this one is not uh, developed by uh, other th uh, things that these two. And so we keep our parks. 
so this is um, a way that uh, the United States kind of plans their cities is using land use. So you can also plan it based on your uh, transportation grid. So you have a centralized area here with a central hub where um, basically your downtown is, where most of your, your commuters would go to, and then you have fingers of transportation that go out to that. And this is where everybody lives, out in the suburbs. Also, a lot of these areas can be what we call mixed use, and I'll get into that in a minute. You can also have then connections between these sub-hubs here, and uh, therefore you can have efficient travel and mass transit between the areas where people live and the areas that people work. And so this is basically how a city in Brazil has set up their uh, infrastructure, uh, and it, it seems to be working very well for this particular city. Uh, and unfortunately in the United States we haven't used this that much. So here's a plan. Uh, this is a place of, uh, I can't really pronounce this, Yesplanty in Michigan. And this is their land use map. And you can find these maps for any uh, metropolitan area in the United States. Here in Hillsborough County we have our own map. It was just too big for me to use for this uh, demonstration. But um, basically it shows that you have different areas here and the colors denote what it is. So all this yellow here is uh, single family. Uh, and then you have areas that uh, have two families, so these are like duplexes, and then you have medium density residential, so they like apartment complexes. And so then you have areas where industrial, and notice how a lot of people actually live away from most of the industrial stuff that's down here. Um, you also have public institutions, so these are like universities here, so those are closer to the housing areas as well. And so you want to separate those things out. Uh, and then your commercial district then is right downtown where everybody works. And the trick is to have feeders coming from these areas using mass transit to make things more efficient. Also, a lot of these areas will be mixed use. And I'll get into that, like I said, in a minute uh, and uh, how that works. All right, so mixed use. Mixed use basically works where you have people living. So you'll have people living up in this area up here. And then down the first floor, you have businesses. So you have things like grocery stores, hardware stores, small hardware stores. You have gyms, uh, all the things that people would need that live up here. So these people don't have to get in their car and go somewhere else most of the time to get their basic needs. So all they have to do is go downstairs and get that. So this is called a mixed use development. And you're starting to see this quite a lot uh, around uh, downtown Tampa. You ever been in the Channel Side District? You see a lot of mixed use. Also, Winthrop area here in uh, off Bloomingdale is also considered a mixed use area. There are people that actually live above some of those stores. This area, and basically, this cuts down on the traffic congestion, cuts down on the pollution, uh, and uh, basically, people can get to work a lot faster that way um, and and get their basic needs faster because a lot of people might, that live up here might work down in these stores as well. Well, I hope that has helped you understand how cities and sustainability work together. Basically, uh, cities uh, need to work to become more sustainable, and that's happening across the globe. You have rooftop gardens, you have uh, parks inside cities, um, and so a lot of cities uh, are really starting to work uh, to become more sustainable, and I hope that helps you out.